Hello, this is Lee Pfeiffer of Twine Entertainment and co-author of The Incredible World of 007, welcoming you to this special commemorative edition of Goldfinger. We begin with the film's director, Guy Hamilton. This always amuses me because it's never shown. Uh, it's Bob Simmons, who's about five inches shorter than Sean. It's very difficult to swim with your head down because uh, you tend to swim a little bit up and the duck was at this angle. So, Sean, keep your head down, but you can't talk to him <laughs> till he puts his head up. And, of course, it's difficult to swim. And by this time, the duck is getting waterlogged. Uh, and as you can see, it's, it looks like a wet cat as, he, as it comes off. Uh, so it was not an easy thing to shoot. Guy Hamilton was the second director to bring James Bond to the screen. The first two films, Dr. No and From Russia With Love, were directed by Terence Young, who brought his own personal style of sophistication to the series. When Young proved unavailable for Goldfinger, Guy Hamilton took over the director's chair and proved he had his own inimitable style of blending spectacular action with a unique sense of humor. Speed is the essence of the exercise here. Ken Adam at his best, you, you don't expect to see a rather ritzy-titsy set inside a tank. Ken Adam was already a well-known production designer when he created the magnificent sets for the first Bond film, Dr. No, in 1962. Sid Kane took over the set designs for From Russia With Love when Ken Adam was hired by Stanley Kubrick to do the production design for Dr. Strangelove, largely as the result of Kubrick having been impressed with Adam's work on Dr. No. When Ken Adam returned to the Bond fold for Goldfinger, he brought with him some of the most inventive ideas ever seen in a major motion picture. This is Sean at his best. I mean, uh, uh, casual. Uh, oh my goodness, what was that? <laughs> this is all done in pine wood. I had difficulty with the crew for the first couple of days because allegedly I was the new boy and they were so busy talking about their past success and what have you that they were bloody lazy and they had to be given a good boot up the ass to um, get him working back on. Uh, <laughs> and then we got on splendidly. The pre-credits teaser was a tradition which started with the second Bond film from Russia with Love. In Goldfinger, however, the trend begins of not having the pre-credits scene relate to the main plot in any way. In essence, the teaser becomes a mini-adventure of its own. Oh! Forgive me. Why do you always wear that thing? I have a slight inferiority complex. Where was I? The reflection, I think, was undoubtedly uh, Dick Maybaum's idea, and it's pretty fairly lunatic, <laughs> but it works. The pre-credit sequence of Goldfinger illustrates the unique qualities which elevated the series into a phenomenon. Within seconds, we experience danger, smoldering sexuality, and outrageous humor. We also see firsthand why Bond is not known as one of the more politically correct screen heroes of our time. Guy Hamilton defends Bond's rather unchivalrous behavior. The interesting thing which I've forgotten was um, Bond has no hesitation in twiddling the girl around and letting her be coshed on the head. And I always had trouble with, um, with all the Bond movies because Bond does beat up the dollies and I see nothing wrong in it. If there are villainesses in uh, Maud Adams, uh, Roger was 
very upset and wouldn't twist her arm. And I said, you know, but you want the truth. Uh, you damn well twist her arm, otherwise now I'll break it if you don't <laughs> tell me what I want to know. Oh, but I don't think that I should be beating up ladies. I said, you know, you're a secret agent. If the girl is a villainess, uh, you'd never beat up a nice girl. But these are, I mean, she'll have your balls for breakfast. Uh, so she must play the game <laughs> both ways. Oh, all right. Beckons you to enter his web of sin. But don't go in. With Goldfinger, the Bond theme songs became blockbuster hits. Played over Robert Brown John's inventive credits, done in the style originated by Maurice Binder on Dr. No, John Barry's famous theme song was delivered to perfection by Shirley Bassey. John and I had worked, uh, he'd done several tracks uh, for pictures long before Bond. Uh, so John and I knew each other quite well. And we talked about Goldfinger. And I was very keen. I'd got a recording of um, a Mac the Knife uh, that seemed to me dirty and gritty and um, it was sort of goldfingerish. And he came up to my uh, apartment and I played this for him. And I think, um, I think it, it cued him in uh, with Tony Newley and Goldfinger, in effect, is a bit Mac the Knife. He was the, um, was the concept. Uh, they picked... Shirley Bassey, uh, and I think, you know, couldn't have done a better job. This heart is cold. He loves only gold. Only gold. The soundtrack album for Goldfinger eclipsed even the Beatles on the charts in 1965. The album went gold. As the credits fade, the story proper begins with the Miami sequence. This happened to be the first scene shot for the movie. However, most of the close-ups of the actors would be filmed in Pinewood Studios. I like this sequence, uh, the, just the three of us, Ted Moore. I'm, uh, I mean, where are you? We're in Miami, we said that. Uh, now we're coming around the corner. I'm down there and I'm cueing the guy on the diving board. Uh, and I can just about tell, right, cue him now. He's watching me down below, so he does a rather splendid dive, and I liked the fact that the hotel had this, I could come on and, um, and we're on with the story, so water, ice skating, everything's happening. Here we meet actor Cease Linder playing CIA agent Felix Leiter. Linder was the only actor in this sequence to have actually been filmed in Miami. Very nice. This is studio. That's a plate. So we were doing... Uh, I hadn't got Sean. I hadn't got Sean. Uh, so it was doing the plates. One of the reasons Guy Hamilton had to shoot around Sean Connery was because the actor was finishing the filming of Marnie for Alfred Hitchcock. He would not be available until the Goldfinger crew returned from Miami to Pinewood Studios in England. Guy Hamilton was not pleased with having to rely on the use of some obvious rear projection techniques and sets for the close-ups featuring Connery, Cease Linder, and actress Margaret Nolan. Incidentally, Nolan, who made a brief but impressive appearance as Bond's masseuse, Dink, was also the golden girl featured in the opening titles. Big operator, worldwide interest, all apparently quite reputable. Owns one of the finest stud farms in the States. What's the tie-up with Washington? He's clean as far as CIA is concerned. Guy Hamilton explains the frustrations of not having his stars available in Miami. Again, this, it's, a, it's an awkward set, this. It's very flat. Uh, that, and I'm, I just have the two American actors there, so I'm trying to intersperse the studio, which is all this is studio, with bits of the real Fontainebleau. I always remember a story once at the Fontainebleau, uh, as a character walking along through the lobby and um, 
he drops a, a dollar on the floor and the guy says, you've, uh, you've dropped a dollar, Mark. And he says, shut up, leave it there. If anybody picks it up, it'll cost me five. The Fountain Blue sequence also formally introduces us to one of the screen's most legendary villains, Auric Goldfinger, portrayed by German actor Gert Frobe. Frobe was a little-known character actor in the German cinema when he was offered the role of Goldfinger. Other acclaimed actors, such as Theodore Bekel, had tested for the part. However, there was something unique about Frobe's screen presence which made Guy Hamilton, Cubby Broccoli, and Harry Saltzman convinced that he was the perfect Goldfinger. Like Connery, Gert Frobe was not present in Miami. The scene in which Goldfinger attempts to cheat his opponent at cards was filmed on a soundstage at Pinewood. When Guy Hamilton filmed the long shots in Miami, he used stand-ins for Gert Frobe and actor Austin Wills, who portrayed Goldfinger's frustrated victim. Yes, I know. You're very sweet. He just threw the king of clubs. That makes us count. This was quite tricksy, getting the plates with uh, the balcony. We spent a lot of time being very careful because this is all studio of getting the plates uh, the right angles to be able to do this. I'd worked with um, Shirley before. I love her dearly. She's an, an amusing, nice girl. There's a lot of story going on. I mean, the Goldfinger is cheating. You want to know how he's cheating. You want to know what Bond has discovered. Um, it's clarity for the audience because it's, uh, unless they're clear about what's happening, they're not going to enjoy. I don't believe in being clever about those things. Say it, make it clear, then they have an excitement of saying, ah, he's always winning at cards, uh, but I suspect uh, he's got that is he deaf, I don't know. You plant everything and let them, let them work it out for themselves, and they say, ah, oh, that's cute, but you haven't cheated. You've given them all the, the elements. No, much too nice to be mixed up in anything like this. The balcony scene introduces us to one of the most remarkable Bond women, Shirley Eaton as Jill Masterson. Although she only appeared in Goldfinger for approximately five minutes, her scenes elevated her to becoming one of the most photographed actresses of 1964. Her stunning looks combined with a sense of playful sexuality helped set the tone for the Bond women to follow. Remember, it was considered shocking at the time to see a woman portrayed as sexually aggressive as a man. Yet Eaton, like Bond actresses Ursula Andress and Daniela Bianchi before her, were far from being the objects of sexual exploitation. As Shirley Eaton's scenes prove, James Bond's women use him for their own selfish pleasure every bit as much as he uses them. Indeed, it could be argued that the Bond films were among the first major motion pictures to present us with fully liberated female characters. Over and out. That should keep him occupied for quite some time. I'm beginning to like you, Mr. Bond. No. Call me James. More than anyone I've met in a long time, James. Well, what on earth are we going to do about it? Yes, what? I'll tell you at dinner. Where? Well, I know the best place in town. The love scene which follows the meeting of James Bond and Jill Masterson is symbolic of the style of the entire series. It is replete with eroticism, carefree sexuality, and most of all, humor. Station WEBS brings you the latest in world news. Washington. At the White House this afternoon, the president said he was entirely satisfied. Well, that makes two of us. The scene also illustrates the abrupt changes of mood in a Bond film. No sooner is the audience distracted by the sensuousness of Jill Masterson's and Bond's double entendres than we are reminded that danger lurks around every corner. In this respect, the series is remindful of the work of Alfred Hitchcock, who always maintained that the most terrifying occurrences are those which take place in the most serene settings. In the midst of his splendid romantic encounter, Bond is about to experience the wrath of Auric Goldfinger, courtesy of the first screen appearance of Harold Sakata's immortal villain Oddjob. 
Cicada is not immediately seen, thus lending an air of mystery and suspense to the sequence. Guy Hamilton recalls that Cicada was a bit over-enthused when delivering his karate chop. Harold was not exactly gentle because he was so used to um, hitting his other, <laughs> which I mean that was a friendly love tap in, in a wrestling ring, but I think it, it uh, caught Sean on the wrong part. This would become one of the most legendary scenes in movie history. The censor was a big uh, pain uh, around this time. In two completely different areas, the Americans, we had to get PG or U for the United Kingdom because all the kids uh, go to see Bond. The American censor absolutely constipated about sex. The British censor couldn't have cared less about that. The British censor panic-stricken about violence. And the American censor totally indifferent to <laughs> violence. So one was doing a fairly fine juggling act. Get over here right away. What's up? The girl's dead. Dink? Uh, Masterson, Jill Masterson. And she's covered in paint, gold paint. See, that, that Sean, I think, looks uh, marvelously smart. You know what happened to cabaret dancers. It's all right, so long as you leave a small bare patch at the base of the spine to allow the skin to breathe. Someone obviously didn't. And I know who. This isn't a personal vendetta, 007. It's an assignment like any other. But if you can't treat it as such coldly and objectively, Bond is seen here in a familiar setting, in the office of his crusty superior, M, played by noted British actor Bernard Lee. Lee was a multi-talented man who endeared himself to his fellow actors. He would portray M in every Bond film through Moonraker in 1979. You're not in the custody of the Miami Beach police. Sir, I'm aware of my shortcomings, but I'm prepared Hello. to... Hello, I'm Lois Maxwell. Now, Bernard Lee, he was a marvelous man. He was a, a very, very talented actor. Um, he was a really quite a musician. He played the piano and he sang and he knew all the old music hall songs and he was a, a great companion. Lois Maxwell makes her third screen appearance as Miss Moneypenny in Goldfinger. By this point, the playful sexuality between Moneypenny and Bond had already become a staple of the series. Lois theorizes that Bond and Moneypenny joined the Secret Service as young adults and gradually developed an attraction to each other. She maintains that the two shared a passion-filled weekend together but were never able to make an emotional commitment because of the demands of their careers. Like Bernard Lee, Lois Maxwell would become a popular member of the Bond stock company and would play Moneypenny in every Bond film through A View to a Kill in 1985. There's hope for me yet. Moneypenny. Won't you ever believe me? Goldfinger was a was an absolute hoot with uh, the hat and and uh, and Shirley and Anna for the first five or six films. We had the same lighting cameraman. We had the same camera crew. We had the same makeup artist. We had the same wonderful hairdresser. We had the same first assistant directors and so on and so on. So it was really like a, a big family. Uh, every time we started a new film and the, the, the family was together, we had the same prop man and we all hugged each other and it was, 
it was, we knew we were going to do something, you know, that was going to be enormously successful. And successful the Bond films were. The first Bond movie, Dr. No, was given an inauspicious debut in America. The studio did not know how to market this unique blend of sex, offbeat humor, and outrageous violence. Only producers Broccoli and Saltzman felt they had a winner on their hands, although both would later admit even they could not foresee the amazing longevity of the series. When Dr. No became the sleeper hit of the year, plans were made to bring another Bond epic to the screen. From Russia with Love premiered in the U.S. in early 1964, and the grosses easily eclipsed those for Dr. No. By the time Goldfinger went into production, there was no hesitation by United Artists in granting a budget which was the cost of the first two films combined. The increased funding allowed for state-of-the-art production values. Goldfinger would be the movie which elevated James Bond from a popular screen hero to an international phenomenon. When it opened in late 1964, the film broke box office records around the world. For many fans and critics, the movie represents the Bond series at its peak and served as the blueprint for the many espionage films and TV series which appeared in the mid-60s. to a business talk, Mr. Goldfinger's kind of business. I need some sort of bait. I quite agree. This is the only one we have from the Nazi... Hall. One of the hallmarks of Bond's success, of course, is his high-tech gadgetry, all provided courtesy of Q Branch. In the first two films, the only notable gadget was the briefcase in From Russia With Love. This time around, however, the gadgets would be far more prominent. In Goldfinger, we will also get the first glimpse of Q's workshop, where we are introduced to the ultimate Bond gadget, the classic Aston Martin DB5. Desmond Llewellyn, who played Q for the second time in Goldfinger, recalls his initial thoughts about the amazing vehicle. It's fascinating. I met somebody the other day, and they were talking about Goldfinger. And the chief thing he remembers about that was the revolving number plates. I mean, when you think of ejector seats and everything there, but the only thing he really sort of thing was the revolving number plates. Really, until Diamonds of Forever, I never bothered about any of this stuff. I just learnt my lines, hope I got them right and said them. And it wasn't until Tom Carlyle, who was the publicity um, man, wanted me to go to America for a um, promotion tour of Diamonds of Forever. But I thought, well, I'd better try and find out something about the gadgets. And it was then that I became interested and got absolutely fascinated by them. There are two schools of thought that you either surprise the audience, I mean, you say, here's a car which is full of very special gadgets, uh, cut, and then gradually as the film goes on, you reveal all these magic gadgets, and that was fundamentally my first thought of how to do it. And Cubby Broccoli, at a very late stage, uh, said, aren't you going to tell... Uh, I said, no, you know, let them find out. It's more fun, more exciting to discover it as you go along. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, tell them what you're going to do and then do it. I, so I had to write a load of dialogue. If I can have your undivided attention for the next uh, hour, Bond, uh, it does this, it does that, and the other thing. Poor Desmond was panicking because he hadn't learnt the dialogue. Uh, it was Friday afternoon and we're running out of um, <laughs> time. Uh, and Cubby is 100% right, no question. I thought it was all that was going to end on the cutting room floor, but the audience anticipation, knowing that there's an ejector seat, knowing that it does this, knowing when is it going to come into play, and uh, that was undoubtedly the way to do it, and I'm always grateful for Cubby. Ejector seat, you're joking. I never joke about my work, 007. Bond's first face-to-face -face meeting with Goldfinger and Oddjob takes place at Stoke Poges Golf Course outside London. Here we are treated to another Bond tradition, a highly civilized initial encounter between 007 and his adversary. The conversation appears to be disarmingly courteous, but it is sprinkled with innuendo, suspicion, and implied threat. The characters of Goldfinger and Oddjob are arguably the most memorable in any Bond film, if not the entire action-adventure film genre. In reality, however, both Gert Frobe and Harold Sakata 
are remembered by their colleagues as being gentle, courteous men with highly contagious senses of humor. Sean Connery in particular recalls his fondness for Frobe and Sakata. Connery, incidentally, had never played golf prior to Goldfinger. In learning the sport for the film, he found himself addicted, and his obsession with golf endures today. This is where Sean had to be coached a little bit in, uh, in golf, and uh, this is where the start of his great love affair, which has lasted for the rest of his life, and believe me, golf more important than, uh, than work as far as Sean is concerned. If Sean Connery relished his newfound love of golf on the set, Gert Frobe was equally enthused about the fame and fortune his star-making role as Goldfinger would hopefully bring him. Indeed, his hopes would be realized. After the film premiered, Frobe basked in unanimous praise from critics and the public. He became a popular supporting actor in many prestigious films, including Chitty Chitty Bang Bang for Cubby Broccoli. In 1940, smelt from the Weigener Pound at Essen. Part of a smelt of 600. They vanished in 1944. When the Nazis were on the run. And you have access to more? Yes, from the same source. Interesting. Frobe continued to act until his death in 1988 at age 75. The only unpleasant side effect of his newfound fame occurred when Goldfinger was set to premiere in Israel. Unsubstantiated rumors began to circulate that Frobe had been a loyal member of the Nazi party during World War II and was trying to conceal his past. The accusations caused a scandal in Israel and theaters refused to show the film. Frobe's reputation was saved when a Jewish man revealed that not only had Frobe not been a Nazi, but he had risked his life to save Jews. Overnight, Frobe was transformed from villain to hero, and Goldfinger premiered to record-breaking grosses in Israel. Guy Hamilton found Frobe a fascinating man to work with and particularly enjoyed directing him in the golf course sequence, despite the fact that Frobe could not play the game. What is impressive about the scene is how much suspense and vital plot information is generated during the course of the golf game, which is generally considered to be the most uncinematic of sports. Lots of doubles here because, I mean, obviously, uh, Gert is not a, a golfer. The fun for this sequence, uh, working on it, is it's quite complex in terms of the rules of golf. You know, you've got five minutes to look for a lost ball. Uh, uh, I didn't know that balls had different numbers on. You've got to assume that 99% of the audience have never played golf, know nothing about it. So... Each uh, move is explained, so you don't have to be a golfer to enjoy, uh, to know what's going on and understand uh, who's winning, who's losing, and how you know that that's not the ball. It's, it's fun and a challenge to write a sequence where people have to understand something which is really quite complicated and make it simple. For Sean Connery, it was a long road from his impoverished childhood in Scotland to the elegant world of James Bond. In this 1974 interview, he reflects on the early days of playing 007. Well, I'd done uh, quite a lot of uh, uh, plays up at Oxford and uh, television uh, specials in England. And um, they were talking about having a national poll. And there was a lot of names associated with it. And, but what people uh, forget is that there was no money in the film. The original Dr. No, the budget was, um, I think, probably a million dollars, which really left very little room for them to take uh, somebody who was going to command uh, well, a large portion of it. So consequently, they would uh, have preferred um, a new face, as it were, in cinematic terms. And, uh, so I went along and I met Fleming. The only difference was I, they wanted me to do a test. And I wouldn't test for it, because, uh, partly because I, I, f I wanted to play a sort of, sort of humorous aspects of it that was very difficult to explain in terms of what they had written as their script. But I'm not absolutely sure to this day why, but uh, they eventually agreed. Uh, the general public press uh, they were not too impressed with the film. It was more like the Times and the Guardian in England, and it was the French, actually, that uh, took it upon themselves to claim the Bond film, the original one, as something more than just an ordinary film of that genre. In fact, creating another one. 
and the evidence to that was it, how long it took before they did uh, From Russia With Love, which was, I think, nearly 18 months afterwards. And uh, the film gained momentum after quite a considerable time. When Gert Frobe arrived on the set, Guy Hamilton was shocked to discover he could not speak English. This necessitated Frobe to speak words phonetically so that actor Michael Collins could dub him later. In fact, not one word of Frobe's actual voice is heard in the film. Even Olivier playing the role, if the mouth is moving slowly, you can't uh, speed up. And so that was basically the trick that we used. Otherwise, you see, you get my dear Mr. Bond, I would like to, you know, you've got to say, my dear Mr. Bond, or whatever, and that's fine. Then you can, because the lips are moving fast enough uh, for when you do the dubbing, uh, to get a rhythm. At this point, Bond and the audience get a demonstration of Odd Job's deadly abilities and sets the stage for the ultimate showdown we know will occur. And there are three cuts there, and there's a little bit. Uh, there's a little bit on. It starts off all right. It's a uh, little bit through the air on a wire. Uh, the head's prepared. Uh, it's pretty straightforward stuff. Check made out to cash. That would be perfectly satisfactory. Goodbye, Mr. Bond. Sean hated this because he thought. Uh, Odd job squashing a golf ball was ridiculous and it wouldn't be in the picture because <laughs> nobody can squash a golf ball. And I'm trying to say, but that's the whole point that you know that you and Odd job are going to meet somewhere later in the picture. <laughs> I mean, there's got to be a confrontation between the pair of you. Uh, look at the way he smirks at you in a second. I mean, he really. <laughs> You know that mother. And now I want to say, yeah, but you're going to be in trouble because this is a guy who can squash golf balls, so can imagine what he can do <laughs> if ever he lays one hand on you. You're going to be in real trouble. If there is one star who eclipses Sean Connery on the basis of Goldfinger's success, it is the Aston Martin DB5. In fact, several DB5s were built for the film, each of which performed various functions. Upon the release of Goldfinger, the car proved to be such a phenomenal success with audiences that an additional car was built strictly for promotional tours. The classic DB5, named the most famous car in the world by author Dave Worrell in his book of the same title, continues to draw large crowds at public appearances over 30 years later. This scene is also significant because it introduced the Ford Mustang to Europe. The car, which was donated by Ford in return for publicity, is driven by actress Tanya Mallet, who plays Tilly Masterson, sister of Jill Masterson, Goldfinger's gilded victim. Tilly is tracking Goldfinger to avenge the death of her sister. In Ian Fleming's novel, Tilly plays a more prominent role in the story, and a large portion of the narrative is devoted to her drive across Switzerland in search of Goldfinger. The film version eliminates all of this and allows Tilly to make a dramatic entrance as one of the few women who managed to represent a challenge to 007. Here we see many key ingredients of the Bond films coming together seamlessly. The hero in the midst of his mission, the high-tech equipment in the form of the Aston Martin, the introduction of a mysterious and beautiful woman, and the presence of the villain. All of this amidst the breathtaking locations which had already become a hallmark of the series. I enjoyed looking for these locations uh, because Switzerland was very, very beautiful. And finding, to try and find uh, a road which had the S-bends.
this is the one that's important. And you have to do a lot of hunting around to find where you can stage that. It is in this sequence where we first see Bond utilize some of the amazing devices contained within the DB5. The tire slasher has been called a modern extension of the knives fastened to chariots. In actuality, the device could not be mounted on the real DB5 due to logistical problems. The close-ups of the tire slashing was filmed in the studio on mock-ups of the wheels. Everybody contributed uh, a little bit, and then you thought, well, smoke's obvious, how about some oil, because we could uh, have the cars behind skidding. Um, we've got to stop uh, Tilly. Uh, how do we stop Tilly? Oh, Ben Hur, out come the, and we'll slash the tires. Every little bit came along. It's naughty, isn't it? The introduction of the Aston Martin DB5 and its arsenal was not without controversy. It has been said that with this car, the Bond films began to overly rely on the use of gadgetry. For some, it meant that the character of Bond took a back seat to the hardware. Indeed, over the course of the series, there have been situations in which Bond merely pushed a button or two to escape a death trap, whereas in the early films, he had to rely on his wits. Yet the general consensus from the audience is that the gadgets are a popular mainstay of the series and the few films in which the hardware was downplayed have not been the strongest contenders at the box office. I'll take that. Yes, of course. What's your name, by the way? Soames. Tilly Soames. Here for the hunting season. I had a case just like that one. It's for my ice skates. It's a lovely sport. And where do you skate? St. Moritz. I didn't know there was ice there this time of the year. There's a garage. There's a terrible drama in this scene. Uh, it is at a petrol station in Switzerland. And in the previous bonds, uh, Mrs. Saltzman had always appeared uh, as a sort of Hitchcock gag, you know. Um, in uh, Russia, I think she's in one of the train windows as the train pulls out, waving and uh, something. And it, uh, adorable. I mean, you know, why not? Um, uh, I didn't know about this, and Mrs. Saltzman was saying, uh, when is my part? Uh, da, 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 and, uh, and Harry said, oh, you know, it's just... Um, it's a good luck thing in the family that uh, put her in the background any way you like in the thing. And, uh, instance, and so I made her the petrol attendant. <laughs> uh, and she's in, um, she's in uh, an outfit, because I thought that was fun, because she wanted, you know, obviously to be seen at her very best. Unfortunately for Mrs. Saltzman, her screen career was to be short-lived. Her part ended up on the cutting room floor. Although much of the film was shot on location in Switzerland, the majority of Goldfinger was made at Pinewood Studios. Due to the magic of Peter Hunt's editing, we observe James Bond spying on Goldfinger's factory at an actual Swiss location. But when the night scenes occur and Bond infiltrates the compound, we are in Pinewood. Again, lucky to find a nice modern plant to, uh, in Switzerland. This is all Pinewood, running around the stages of Pinewood. <laughs> Pine
Pinewood remains one of the world's most active and legendary movie studios. Indeed, it seems as though virtually every major British film has shot at least some sequences there. Today, the historic studio looks much the same as it did when Goldfinger was shot there. One can still see the very places which doubled for these scenes at Goldfinger's factory. As Bond spies on Goldfinger and his red Chinese accomplice, film fans may recognize a familiar face. The character of Mr. Ling, who Goldfinger is explaining the finer points of Operation Grand Slam, is played by Bert Quoke, better known to audiences as Cato, the long-suffering sidekick to Inspector Clouseau in the Pink Panther series. Quoke would later appear as a Spectre henchman working for Blofeld in You Only Live Twice in 1967. The studios at Pinewood remained home to the James Bond series from the first movie, Dr. No, in 1962, through the 16th Bond entry, License to Kill, in 1989. When the Bond films became increasingly spectacular, more sequences were shot on location. Interiors, however, continued to be filmed at Pinewood until 1995, when, due to a lack of sound stages at the studio, the Bond team had to find another site for the 17th 007 epic, GoldenEye. The producers ultimately converted a former Rolls-Royce factory at Leavesden, England, into one of the largest film studios in the world. Here, Pierce Brosnan brought his own unique vision of James Bond to the screen, as Sean Connery had done at Pinewood all those years ago. The sequences of Bond and Tilly fleeing through the woods were not filmed at Pinewood, Rather, they were shot at nearby Black Park, a public recreation area minutes from the studio. Movie fans might recognize the surroundings from other films, notably the Hammer Horror classics. Like Pinewood Studios, Black Park remains almost identical to the way it appeared in Goldfinger, and many a Bond fan still makes a pilgrimage to this beautiful and serene location. This sequence is highly anticipated by the audience, as they have been informed by Q about all the special gadgetry contained in the Aston Martin DB5. The fans have waited patiently to see just how Bond will employ these devices, and their patience will be rewarded. What many Bond aficionados may not know is that the original plans for the Aston Martin included several key devices which never made it into the final cut. Production designer Ken Adam and special effects supervisor John Steers let their imaginations go unbounded in designing the vehicle. Ian Fleming's original novel had Bond driving the Aston Martin with a few low-key modifications. Adam and Steers deemed these too subdued for a James Bond film epic, and in a matter of weeks designed a car with so many incredible gadgets that the movie could not contain them all. Among the devices originally planned, a secret compartment concealed near the taillights from which nails were dispensed to thwart pursuers. The filmmakers decided that some of the less intelligent members of the public might emulate this gadget, so it was never employed in the movie. The car was also equipped with a hidden weapons tray, which contained a pistol, folding rifle, throwing knife, and grenade. Again, this is never seen on screen. Neither was the telephone, which was concealed in the armrest. The idea of a car phone was still exotic in 1964. A small radar dish was originally concealed in the outside mirror, and the car was also designed with special overriders above the bumpers, which were to be used for ramming other vehicles. Neither of these functions are utilized by Bond in the film. Not all of the unused gadgets envisioned by Ken Adam pertain to the Aston Martin. In the course of researching this project, the producers of this laser disc went through the archives at Eon Productions and discovered original blueprints for devices that were designed to be used in Goldfinger and Thunderball but never made it onto the screen. These included a thermos with a built-in hand grenade, a new updated attaché case with lethal weaponry, and in Q's workshop, a lunch truck which conceals a cannon, giving an all-new meaning to the term hot meal. Run for that dragon when I tell you. Guy Hamilton recalls the filming of the sequence in Black Park. It was meant to be two nights, I think, and uh, it turned out to be three. And that's how uh, the cameraman went off to Fort Knox ahead of me, and I went the following night. We do get rid of the girls at a high rate of knots, don't we? <laughs> 
In this scene, we discover that Tilly Masterson will be the film's so-called sacrificial lamb. Beginning with the character of Quarrel in Dr. No, virtually every Bond film has their traditional character who befriends Bond only to fall victim to the villain. In some cases, the sacrificial lamb is Bond's lover, while in others, he's a valued friend or colleague. Tilly's sudden death at the hands of Oddjob is a jarring moment for the audience. We have come to know her and sympathize with her. Our first inclination is that she will remain in the story as Bond's accomplice. Suddenly, in the blink of an eye, she is dead, and the roller coaster ride of emotions that any good Bond film takes us on is amply illustrated. Naturally, it is the job of screenwriters Richard Maybaum and Paul Dean, as well as Guy Hamilton, to ensure that we don't linger too long on the morose aspects of the story. It's necessary for a bit of humor to be introduced. Guy Hamilton recalls how one of Goldfinger's least seen but most memorable characters came to be. Whilst I was in California, just after Goldfinger opened there, um, Alfred Hitchcock was kindly asked me to lunch, or was a, lunch was arranged, and I went and had lunch in his um, bungalow at Universal, and we had a lot to talk about because uh, he was asking me about a lot of his old uh, friends in the UK. And uh, he never mentioned Goldfinger. And then suddenly at the end, he said, um, that little old lady who uh, opens the gate. And then uh, when he, you know, nice gamutli kites, and then, you know, she's got the machine gun. I like that. I wish I'd done it. And it's the nicest thing Hitchcock ever said to me. <laughs> Here we see another staple of the Bond tradition, the rapid utilization of the gadgets. It is essential to get these devices into the story as the DB5 is about to be removed from the plot the hard way. My son, who was about 11 or 12 at the time, uh, I always think that he, was, he came up with the ejector seat because he'd, um, he said, wouldn't it be wonderful if... Uh, this doesn't quite work. Uh, the mirror, the mirror's a bad shape. It's not too clear. The idea is good, but the uh, execution leaves a lot to be desired. The reality is people come to you and say, I love it, you know, when the ejection seat, and he thought, oh, I thought that was so funny. Uh, it's so easy. I mean, you do, you do absolutely nothing. It's, there's no directing involved. You set the scene up, you, uh, uh, no directing. The, it always, the things that give you the most satisfaction are things that are very complicated, that you manage to solve the problem uh, either on the set or in the cutting room, um, months later you found a way round and you say, hey, wasn't that terrific? If the image of Shirley Eaton painted goal represents the most famous sequence in a Bond film, then 007's near castration by laser beam must rank a close second. In the novel, Bond is threatened with dissection by a buzz saw but of course, a more high-tech menace was required for the cinema. What's interesting about the laser beam is, at that time, the only thing we knew about the laser is that you could uh, point it to the moon. You know, it was just a straight line. It had no uses whatsoever. I mean, there was talk about, eventually, in the medical profession, they were going to use it for... Uh, eye operations um, and the sort of thing. Uh, and it had no known um, use. And of course, when we read about it's a straight line and it's uh, uh, obviously cut Bond's testicles off. That's the best use we can have for a laser. So this, this, this is 
wonderful nonsense. Uh, now everybody knows about lasers and they're in industrial quantities and used all day long, but in Goldfinger time, nobody knew anything about lasers. The purpose of our two previous encounters is now very clear to me. I do not intend to be distracted by another. Good night, Mr. Bond. Do you expect me to talk? No, Mr. Bond, I expect you to die. There is nothing you can talk to me about that I don't already know. Hey, you're forgetting one thing. If I fail to report, 008 replaces me. I trust he will be more successful. Well, he knows what I know. You know nothing, Mr. Bond. Operation Grand Slam, for instance. The laser scene will no sooner end than we are finally introduced to the female lead in Goldfinger, British actress Honor Blackman. Blackman, unlike the previous Bond actresses, was a bona fide star when she signed for Goldfinger. She had risen to fame as the result of her role as Kathy Gale in the classic TV series The Avengers. The role of Pussy Galore required a capable actress with a sensuous screen presence. Honor Blackman fit the bill on both counts. In fact, producers Broccoli and Saltzman was so determined to get Blackman for the role of Pussy Galore that they had the script altered to include her proficiency with judo. It's very difficult to get back to the climate that one had then, but until that moment, there had been really two kinds of women. There was the the dyed blonde in the black bra and black stockings that the, the men were unfaithful to their wives with, or there was the little wife who stayed at home and washed the dishes and waited for him to come back. And Kathy Gale was the first woman who was intellectually uh, the equal of the man, uh, as intelligent as the man, and, and above sure. all, fought like a man. Well, fought better than the man in that. Oh. Patrick always used to say to me, darling, you're going to hurt yourself. Don't, why don't you do what I do? Which was duel with an umbrella or something. Can you see yeah. it? So I said, you play that part and I play the other. I, I guess a lot of myself went into it. I don't know if I started off aggressive or if the Avengers made me aggressive. I think, I think I've always wanted to defend the right. I think I've always hated bullies. Three times I bashed boys. I mean, I gave them a right uppercut. Um, one I actually knocked right out because they were bullying my brother. And I always went to his defense. And I was taught to box as a child with a pillow hung in the doorway because my brother was picked on and, and after a very bloody fight, my father said, now he'll learn to box and whatever Ken did, I did. So I learned to box, and I was very good at the right uppercut. <laughs> and that's why, later on, I was able to use it uh, in his defense. Ah, uh, yes, to Operation Grand Slam. This should be a memorable flight. You can turn off the charm. I'm immune. We'll be landing in Baltimore, our port of entry into the United States, in 55 minutes. By Lee. The merchandising, uh, strictly not my business, you know, uh, couldn't care less. I used to get a little bit angry. Uh, Harry used to sort of suddenly come on the set uh, in, the, in the plane. 
the pussy galore playing crossing the Atlantic and Bond wakes up and uh, pops okay. into the uh, to shave. And suddenly the whole thing was a Gillette exercise. You've never seen anything like it. The, there was Gillette foam, there was Gillette aftershave, there was... Harry, what are you doing at 8 o'clock in the morning where the crew haven't even arrived, dressing the set? And he'd sort of done a deal with Gillette, you know, and, and um, we were going to get, you know, sixpence if they saw this and if... And, uh, and he wouldn't... And he was being very naughty, he wouldn't sort of get down to it. He says, I mean, you know, if Sean... I mean, it says, you know, if Sean can shave with the... Uh, um, I said, you know, Harry, I mean, what's going on? Um, you know, it was fairly obvious, and I threw all the props out. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then by the time we got to Diamonds, it was a well-organized uh, thing, and I said, look, it's simple. Uh, give me a list of all the things that you want to use, um, uh, from condoms down to zebras, and I'll tick off what I can uh, happily... Uh, yeah, there's a, there's a place here for a zebra. We could um, have a zebra walk past. I mean, uh, it doesn't... Um, yeah, fine, you know. Uh, no, I can't use... Uh, so forget that. And that, was, that worked reasonably well. We'll be landing in 20 minutes. Do you want well, to somebody jumped on the bandwagon who had um, various aeroplanes and thought it would be a good publicity stunt if I learned to fly. And I was getting on quite well. Uh, the only trouble was that I felt, um, I felt that I was being rather hurried because it would be very good uh, if I got my license and they all got the kudos for having taught me. And just as I was getting near my solo, um, I got a film in, in Hollywood and um, I had to go out there for some months and then both my children were adopted and the moment I came back one of my adopted children arrived and so life changed entirely and I never finished it. I don't know that I really would have enjoyed it. I, I, was, I loved being up there, but I quite liked having somebody with me. <laughs> we did have a fair old joke, but when I, I as I started learning, because the, part, the uh, instructor was awfully nice, and I used to tear down the runway, you see, and as all the hedges and trees came up, the instructor would say, had you thought of taking off, Miss Blackman? <laughs> because I like ground speed so much, you know, like that. And it, all of a sudden, I'd lift up over the, the hedges and stuff. He was so relieved that I did actually do it. But there, you know, they make you yaw the plane, which is uh, uh, like that. So, I mean, you have to have a fairly strong stomach. And we used to nosedive and then pull out at the last moment. I mean, I did learn a lot, but I'm not sorry that I didn't actually achieve, especially when I learned that once I had got my, my pilot's license, I then had to go through something entirely different in order just to be able to fly across to France, France, which was my, my first and best idea, because I thought it would be rather nice to fly over for, for lunch on a Sunday. But then you had to go through another whole routine. My life was too busy, really, to accommodate it. The flying circus of Pussy Galore was made up of some of the most stunning women to ever grace a 007 epic. However, as Guy Hamilton explains, things are not always what they seem in the world of James Bond. I do remember, and we're doing Pussy Galore's Flying Circus. These were a load of uh, crop duster pilots. And, they all, and we bought them from Woolworths, the most terrible blonde wigs. Uh, and so up in the air we go, and they're sitting there with uh, cigars in their mouths, but they feel that they're not going to wear the wigs because they look idiotic, and we're screaming at them to get on their goddamn wigs because every time we pass, pussies galore's flying circus. <laughs> uh, and if you look carefully, I think occasionally you can see a cigar on <laughs> one of the pilots passing by. 
Here are, don't look too closely at the wigs on those. Um, I think the girl's a little bit over the top. In the novel, Pussy Galore is an unabashed lesbian, but the film version only hinted at this. Well, again, you have to censorship in those days. You had to, you know, box clever. Uh, you wanted to suggest it, but, I mean, you can't say that Bond is, uh, it makes a statement about lesbianism or anything like that. I mean, it's just part of the, uh, we're not going to stop and get heavy <laughs> about that. Um, Anybody that thinks that she's a dyke, terrific, because it's much more fun when Bond um, turns her around and makes her see the light of day. Uh, and for those of you who can appreciate that, goody-goody for the kids, uh, on we go. This was one of the great things with, the, uh, with these double entendres. Uh, every now and then, Trevelyan, who was our big enemy, said, you can't say that. I said, come on, John. Uh, I mean, if an 11-year-old understands, so long as the collars and cuffs match, he's a dirty little bugger, and, uh, and um, what are you going to do about it? Believe me, 90% of the 11-year-olds, it'll go sailing over their heads, and they'll take it uh, not as a double entendre, but as a straight statement. If the dirty little bugger understands, then um, he's in advance of his years, and you can't protect him. So don't be... Uh, and that, I think, is a, that was always my attitude to these things, that you don't smirk at it, you throw them away, and um, if they get it, they get it. Bond's CIA colleague, Felix Leiter, plays a fairly prominent role in the story. C. Slinder, who portrayed Leiter in Goldfinger, was one of several actors who would play the role throughout the course of the series. Only one actor would play Leiter more than once, David Hedison in Live and Let Die and License to Kill. Other actors in the part were Jack Lord in Dr. No, Rick Van Nutter in Thunderball, Norman Burton in Diamonds Are Forever, and John Terry in The Living Daylights. We now arrive at one of Ken Adams' most memorable sets, the so-called Rumpus Room of Auric Goldfinger. Adam's unique sense of style and creative design work mask the fact that the sequence itself exists only to advance the plot. Goldfinger wants these gangsters killed, so why bother to go through the elaborate show? Well, the Bond films are always willing to sacrifice a bit of logic for the sake of providing a few thrills. And this scene proves the strategy is a wise one. Now I find I'm attending a Hoods convention. Goldfinger, I made a delivery. Where is my money? I made a delivery, too. You all made the deliveries we contracted for. And you owe me one million bucks. I owe each of you a million. In gold bullion. So pay. Gentlemen, you can have the million today. Or ten millions tomorrow. Did you say ten million? As soon as my bank opens, in the morning. Banks don't open on Sunday. My bank will. <laughs> it's enjoyable because this is the Bond team working at its best. This is, I mean, a great set from Ken Adam. Uh, a good scene to play. The billiard table is, is cute. Uh, that works, and it works very gracefully, very well, revolves, turns, and knobs and bits and pieces. The, I like big model, I mean, it, you could have done it uh, very easily with, a, you know, just a photograph, but no, we're going to go for the full Megillah. We're going to, again, tell the audience, there's Fort Knox, and there's nothing around it, so it sounds... Uh, possible to raid it. We're, t we're laying out the plot. Now, come on, I'll amaze you. Watch the floor. It's going to open. the United States, knock off Fort Knox. Got a key or something? Of a kind. There are 35,000 troops stationed around there. At this point, we should mention the contribution of editor Peter Hunt to the series. 
Hunt's innovative style of fast cuts was something unique to feature films. Hunt initiated his own vision of how the Bond film should be cut beginning with Dr. No in 1962. Audiences which were used to such standard editing techniques as slow dissolves between scenes were fascinated by the frantic pace of the Bond films. Under Peter Hunt, there was nary a wasted frame. The action moved at lightning fast pace, much to the delight of the director and screenwriters who did not want the audience to have too much time to consider implausibilities in the plot. Hunt would sweep you into fantastic scenes before you had time to recover from the last one. Peter Hunt would edit Dr. No, From Russia With Love, Goldfinger, and Thunderball before he began to crave a career as a director. He did the second unit direction on You Only Live Twice in 1967 and made his directorial debut with On Her Majesty's Secret Service in 1969, considered by many to be among the best Bond films ever made. Hunt went on to a successful directing career which included the epic adventures Gold and Shout at the Devil, both of which starred Roger Moore. This just works only just. This much is cute. You know something's up. What's up? <laughs> you see, I wish I could have had a shot of Sean right across the door, which, which he couldn't stay in that position. That's a shot I couldn't get. Then you'd have gone to the close up, then he falls, but you need to see him art over. But uh, there's no way that just with your hands and your feet you would be able. I mean, a, a tremendous athlete could, but uh, couldn't quite do that. It's time to acknowledge the contribution of Bob Simmons, the stunt coordinator on many of the Bond films. Simmons began working for Cubby Broccoli in the mid 50s on the film Paratrooper. Cubby was so impressed by Simmons that he promised to employ him on all of his future films. Broccoli was true to his word, and when Dr. No went into production, Bob Simmons was not only a stuntman on the film, but he was also in charge of coordinating all the action sequences. Simmons doubled for Sean Connery throughout the series, as well as other actors. He would painstakingly plan each fight scene and film it doubling for Sean Connery. Connery would then film his sequences, which would be edited into the final cut. It can be, I think the expression is, blown. My plan is foolproof, gentlemen. I call it Operation Grand Slam. I have devoted 15 years of my life to it. Every detail has been scrupulously prepared. Every eventuality has been considered. We will operate on a split-second schedule. Your organization, Mr. Midnight, brought a consignment of these canisters across the Canadian border. They contain Delta 9. Delta 9? What's that? An invisible nerve gas, which disperses 15 minutes after inducing complete unconsciousness for 24 hours. Interestingly, Guy Hamilton's dissatisfaction with the middle section of the film was not echoed by others. The general consensus seems to be Goldfinger is a tightly structured adventure that is notable for near-perfect blend of thrills, humor, and sexuality. My task force which Mr. Strap and his people smuggled across the Rio Grande from Mexico, will approach Fort Knox in motorized equipment along Bullion Boulevard, which runs past the depository here and intersects with Gold Vault Road. This fence surrounding the depository, as Mr. Strap reminded us, is electrified. It will be dynamited. My task force will then move to the main entrance and demolish it. How, may I ask? You made that possible, Mr. Solo, by arranging through your considerable influence in shipping circles to bring through customs uninspected a consignment labeled machine parts. All that will then remain is to descend to the vaults, where the bullion is stored. I've heard enough. Let him... If you have no objection... The sexual element of Goldfinger did create a controversy with censors in England, and not because of any controversial scenes. Rather, the tempest in a teapot was over the use of the name Pussy Galore, 
Censors in England demanded that the name be changed to the less suggestive and less threatening Kitty Galore. Broccoli and Saltzman's arguments with Studio Brass fell on deaf ears until Prince Philip visited the set and was photographed with Honor Blackman. The caption under the photo in the newspaper read, Pussy and the Prince. The producers argued that if the name was fit for a family newspaper, it was appropriate on the big screen. They had prevailed, although timid publications often did not mention the character's name in its entirety, preferring to refer to her as either Pussy or Miss Galore. The children's trading card set went so far as to feature only one photo of Honor Blackman and billed her rather awkwardly as Goldfinger's female pilot. Who takes Ian Fleming that seriously? It's an adventure story. It's fun. It's tongue-in-cheek. I mean, when you think of all the terrible things, for example, when Sean through the uh, electric fire into the bath. Oh, shocking. Yeah, I mean, it's very much tongue-in-cheek, isn't it? But I mean, it was very funny in the States. I was quite shocked that they were shocked. We I, was, I was rather taken aback. So I used to quite deliberately say, oh, you mean pussy? <laughs> and he used to die and cut and all that sort of thing, you know. Although he was playing an evil genius with no regard for human life, actor Gert Frobe was concerned about the use of gas to murder the villains. He felt that a German actor utilizing this method of killing might seem insensitive to the Holocaust victims. Guy Hamilton convinced Frobe that the scene was being done in the larger-than-life context of a fantasy film. Reluctantly, Frobe played the scene. Paul uh, Gert Frobe was very, very nervous and very upset about all this. Uh, delicately spoke to me because it had uh, gas chamber connotations to him. Uh, I mean, I appreciated his, uh, his concern, but um, he, as a German, was a bit nervous. However, Ah, oh, Mr. Bond, I thought you were resting in your quarters. Oh, they are delightful, but it's much too nice to stay indoors. Uh, I ran into Miss Galore, and she suggested that we join you. Mr. Solo, Mr. Bond, another of my distinct... The character of Mr. Solo, played by Martin Benson, proved to be controversial. When Ian Fleming suggested to producer Norman Felton that he name the hero of his upcoming espionage TV series, Napoleon Solo, Felton liked the idea so much he named the show itself Solo. When the Bond producers understandably objected that this was a character in Fleming's novel, Felton renamed the show. It's now better known as The Man from Uncle. I found him under the model. An interesting anecdote concerns Michael G. Wilson, who produces the current James Bond films along with Barbara Broccoli. Wilson was an assistant director on Goldfinger and also performed many an odd job, uh, pardon the pun, under the not-so-gentle wing of Guy Hamilton. There was an opening date fixed for Goldfinger at the Odeon Leicester Square, and the, and the Bonds annually seemed to open in, uh, I've forgotten, the September the 15th or something, and whether we were finished or not was immaterial. <laughs> uh, we were on the lot here at Pinewood, and... Uh, Time is running very, very short. Extra people were engaged for the dubbing, for the music laying, the tracks and everything. And three of us went over to uh, Kentucky. Uh, Cubby Broccoli, Ted Moore, the cameraman, myself, and Michael, who was a law student in those days and was on holiday and we commandeered him as T-boy, <laughs> doubling as a Korean. And he was not very popular because one day he forgot Odd Job's hat and he had to go by car for bloody miles and I kicked his ass and, that, and he said, I mean, is movies always like this? I said, yes, if you... <laughs> And I think that was Michael Wilson's first uh, adventures in the movie trade. Hmm, they've turned to the right, just ahead here somewhere. Oh. 
While commonplace today, massive car crushing equipment was a rarity in Britain in 1964. So the following classic sequence was shot in a Miami junkyard. The sight of a glossy new Lincoln meeting such an untimely end proved shocking to crew members and audiences alike. There was no auto crash in Europe. There were totally new things uh, to us. So this is, we went outside Miami and uh, found an auto crash and on a weekend. That's a double for our job. And we shot all this, uh, I think, on a Saturday afternoon. Then we ran these rushes in New York a few days later. And I remember suddenly they stopped, and out came an outraged projectionists who said, did you guys shoot this? And we said, yes, don't you think it's rather good? He said, do you know that's a Lincoln Cont Do you know how much that costs a Lincoln? I mean, you guys just put a Lincoln Continental and you put it in the crash. I mean, that's a... I mean, he was outraged at the end. <laughs> uh, he said, you I mean, you guys are nuts. <laughs> Returning to Gert Frobe, the actor was physically perfect for the part of Goldfinger. As mentioned previously, however, his verbal skills in the English language were another story. Honor Blackman was among those who bluffed her way through her dialogue with Frobe. Gert knew he was going to be dubbed because he knew his English wouldn't be up to standard. But he wanted to have a go, and it would help the, the synchronization later on. But it was the most alarming way when, you, when your very first scene with him that you didn't understand anything. But he was a sweet man, a very nice man. It was his first picture in English, and he was studying like mad, and he, he became very good at English. I mean, we can laugh. We're not very good playing in German or, or French. And uh, what he was actually saying was, um, Operation Grand Slam will make you a very rich woman, Miss Galore. And I, I, to this day, I don't know what he said. Actor Michael Mellinger, who played the villain Kish, provides his own perspective on the making of the film and working with Gert Frobe. Hello, this is Michael Mellinger. I played the part of Kish in uh, Goldfinger way back in 1964. I had lunch together with Gert Frobe. He told me, he said, uh, um, a, a well-known uh, drama teacher said to him when he was a, uh, a beginner, he said, uh, you are a young Valentin. Now, uh, Valentin was a famous uh, Bavarian comedian. That's what the teacher meant. But Gert Froebe thought, he said, you are a young Valentino. And he, he, he thought he was a great romantic discovery. <laughs> a slight misunderstanding. I suggest you change it to something more suitable. Certainly. Business before pleasure. I knew Sean Connery long before he became famous. We both belonged to an improvisation group that uh, was run by Philip Seville, the director. Oh, this must have been in the, in the 50s. He was extremely nice. Uh, I remember my, my, my kids asked, uh, asked me for an autograph, and he happened to be in the shower at the time. He was stark, bollocked, naked when I, when I asked him, and, uh, and uh, he let me have his autograph. <laughs> oh, Mr. Bond, sit down, please. Mince julep. Traditional, but satisfying. Yes, thanks. Sour mash, but not too sweet, please. Well, of course, I'd seen oh, Dr. No, and thoroughly enjoyed it, and I'd seen uh, Russia with Love, which I thought was one of the really splendid Bond movies. I'd been asked to do uh, Dr. No, but couldn't, so I was fairly familiar with the uh, Fleming and Fleming's books. And Fleming let us down in the book because uh, all the villains get as far as Fort Knox, but they never get in because uh, Fleming never found a way of getting them in. So they all get arrested outside um, and end a story. But you can't do that in a movie, obviously. You can't say we're doing a heist on Fort Knox and uh, say, oh, sorry, kids, we <laughs> never got in. Uh, 
Once we'd found the solution of how to uh, get in to Fort Knox, then everything uh, went according to plan. Go on, Mr. Bond. Mr. Ling, the red Chinese agent at the factory. Although Ian Fleming was not originally enthused about the choice of Sean Connery for James Bond, but of course, he became convinced Connery was the perfect man for the role after seeing Dr. No and From Russia with Love. Fleming had seen very few films in his life, but he was impressed by what Broccoli and Saltzman had done with his novels in bringing them to the screen. Originally, he thought that Hoagie Carmichael would make an appropriate Bond. Fleming unfortunately died in the summer of 1964, one month prior to the release of Goldfinger, a film that would elevate James Bond into the status of a phenomenon. Economic chaos in the West, and the value of your gold increases many times. I conservatively estimate 10 times. Brilliant. But the uh, atomic device, as you call it, is already obviously in this country. Obviously. But bringing it to Fort Knox uh, undetected could be risky, very risky. On the contrary, Mr. Bond, the risk is all on your side. If the authorities should attempt to As if the it, film's visuals weren't grand enough, composer John Barry went all out to create a masterful score. He composed it in record time under great time constraints. Even the most seasoned Bond aficionado, in this case Graham Rye, president of the James Bond fan club and archive in England, is still impressed by Barry's accomplishment. Barry's music probably getting on for debatably one of the best overall scores. Um, and I think that it's a good example to any other composer that if you watch that film, at no time is there, uh, the, the James Bond theme isn't put in arbitrarily. Because Barry used to score those pictures with exclusive music for those particular scenes. It wasn't regurgitated from something else. It was a, it was a new piece for every scene that needed music. we got to know each other socially. Well, the new Miss Galore. Where do you hide your gold knuckles in this outfit? Oh, I uh, never carry weapons after business hours. Yeah? So you're off duty? I'm completely defenseless. So am I. That's my James. Beautiful place Goldfinger has here. Yes. I'm glad you're enjoying it. Stunt coordinator Bob Simmons had his hands full choreographing Bond's barn brawl with Pussy Galore. Honor Blackman, an expert in judo, was used to taking falls on cement from performing her own stunts on the Avengers. Simmons doubled for Sean Connery, and thanks again to Peter Hunt's skillful editing, the audience never notices the five-inch height difference between the men. Neither do they notice the brief use of a stunt woman who took Connery's over-the-shoulder flip. Obviously, the barn, the straw, it has all the connotations of uh, Jane Russell, the outlaw. Um, it's a perfect thing, and I love the idea of Pussy Galore throwing Bond round, and then Bond is no respecter of ladies. It was very funny when we, when we did the fight. Yeah, there's a in it, so-called fight, because um, I had been used to doing judo in the studio on the cement. You know, it's not funny. You're supposed to do judo on the mat if you want to live. And um, so they had banks and banks of straw and all sorts of things. And they said, will that be all right? Will, can you land on it? Will you be safe? And all. I mean, it was luxury for me because I'd had such a terrible time in the studio with, with the cement floor, you know. So uh, we had quite a lot of fun in the hay because we had to lie about for quite a long time. <laughs> Guy Hamilton always kept in mind the fantasy element of James Bond, that these kind of things couldn't possibly happen, and yet somehow they seemed logical. He knew the audience would follow 007 wherever he led them. Well, here's, a, here's the lunacy. I mean, it, it is these little Koreans that run around all day long in these... Um, blue overalls with sashes and little white socks and <laughs> black gym shoes, uh, like an army, you know, in the middle of uh, Kentucky or wherever they are. Uh, you've got to go with that.
Cubby Broccoli's friendship with retired Air Force Lieutenant Charles Ruchon allowed the filmmakers access to many locations near Fort Knox that were ordinarily off limits. It was a lunatic exercise because we flew around right next door to Fort Knox. There is an army base. And Ted and I flew around zooming on whatever these people were doing. We didn't tell them we were coming, we just uh, did it. And of course, you'd get a, a platoon or a squad and they're all, uh, and you know, when a helicopter comes down, uh, you all look up. The commandant of the base was sending messages to stop it, go away, uh, de da de da and Cubby was sort of trying to placate him. Uh, that took all morning and what I had to do was to try and remember the places that we'd been to because in the afternoon we got a squad, a sergeant, and we ran these soldiers round uh, and I set them up in all the places I could remember. And I said, now what you do is uh, when I blow the whistle once, you all look up there. When I blow the whistle twice, you all fall down dead. And they thought this was the silliest thing that they had ever been asked <laughs> to do in their born days. But uh, we said, you know, you're all going to get 10 bucks and a beer uh, for 10 bucks and a beer. <laughs> uh, so we rushed around the camp to these varying places. One whistle, look up, two whistle, fall down dead. And, uh, and back we went with this material. Uh, but by now we're opening in uh, three weeks' time, practically. The rules are that you can't go over Fort Knox more than 5,000 feet or 3,000 feet or something, and we were buzzing it. Zero Mostel's brother-in-law, who was the, runs the depository, was going absolutely bananas, and Cubby was uh, saying, oh, no, I don't think, I think they're about 3,000 feet. <laughs> this is all in the afternoon. These are the same men all over the place. Uh, right, on your feet, and then we run to the next location. Champagne leader, Grand Slam Task Force leader. The baby is asleep. I repeat, the baby is asleep. We're going home now. He is oh. a, an absolutely immaculate, uh, composer, uh, very, very professional. The score for the build-up to Fort Knox, he'd written something which I thought didn't work at all. I can't remember what didn't work about it, but I remember at the recording session, I mean, this is, this is difficult, because uh, in those days there wasn't so much tape. I mean, you had uh, 100 musicians there, and you say, I don't like it. <laughs> Fortunately, I was able to sort of um, make myself understood. And John said, right, got you. And he bent over the score. And in about three minutes flat, rescored it. You know that drum motif that uh, goes through it? That's what uh, came in. And it gave it um, uh, heavy, and I thought that was a brilliant piece of uh, thinking on your feet and um, being able to save money by not calling another session because that would have been due in the end. Now, this is Pinewood. The front of the uh, depository was all we had. Now, the interesting thing is that when we left uh, Miami, uh, there was just Ted Moore, um, Ken Adam, and myself. And with Cubby, we went up to Fort Knox, the depository, and we said, may we come in and have a look around? And, I mean, we knew perfectly what the answer was, but there's no harm in trying. Uh, and I'm very sorry, not even the President of the United States is allowed into Fort Knox. Uh, and whenever the President is in Louisville, Kentucky, he always goes along to Fort Knox, bangs on the door and says, may I come in? And the keeper of Fort Knox says, I'm sorry, Mr. President, but uh, uh, the answer is no, sir, because it was in the Constitution somewhere. It's to stop the president going into Fort Knox and helping himself to the gold bars and what have you. So it's a sort of uh, traditional uh, thing. Uh, and we weren't allowed in because we needed to take some stills, and there are no stills 
uh, of the interior of Fort Knox. Nobody knows what it looks like. The nearest we ever got was in Time magazine. They had some drawings once upon a time of, uh, and it looked insanely dull. It looks like the inside of Sing Sing, just terrible little cells with, uh, I mean, nothing very much happening. Uh, but we needed the reference stills uh, in order even to be able to reproduce the front of Fort Knox. So we were loaded with cameras and going click, 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 and the guy said, but you're not allowed to take photographs. And Cubby would say, oh, I'm sorry, do you hear what he say, guy? And he would walk and said, Ken would go behind me and go click, click, click. And we were clicking away all the reference stills in order to be able to build the inside of Fort Knox. Uh, of course, it was a ball. We could do what the hell we liked because as nobody knows what it's like inside. We could do whatever we wanted. And that's how uh, a, rather, a rather fun inside of Fort Knox happens. Guy Hamilton's friendship with Harold Sakata lasted many years after Goldfinger was completed. Hamilton was always impressed by the actor's gentle nature. He had no idea that uh, he was going to become such a... Uh, because he went back to Hawaii, he went back to wrestling in these uh, um, second-rate shows. And I happened to be in Hawaii with my wife, and I saw Harold Zakata on a, a bill. So I went along to this um, uh, arena, and there was uh, Harold, and I crept up and said, you big Hawaiian puff. And he was in a headlock with some uh, gentleman, and he looked, ah, and he couldn't believe it was me. And then he said, look, it's, this, this is my friend, this is my director. And uh, everybody in the audience booed, and now he's very happy, and we had a good time together in Hawaii. When Ken Adam was denied access to the real Fort Knox, he let his imagination go wild to create what he felt the public wanted the interior to look like. To replace what were probably dusty corridors and dingy storage facilities, Adam fulfilled Cubby Broccoli's decree that he should create a cathedral of gold. The bomb's here. Let's get moving, Brigadier. Right, Jack, move in. Move in, commando tactics. Minimum offensive fire until I signal bomb has been neutralized. Minimum offensive fire until I signal bomb has been neutralized. Bomb disposal unit to a company dog. The multi-level set was a masterpiece of production design that left the producers with the unenviable task of having to top all of this in the next Bond epic. You see, uh, uh, ten, uh, what we did, all the guys are wearing uh, metal things on their boots because they're ever dropping uh, two bars, and if you drop two bars on your toes, it doesn't do them any good. Uh, the weight of uh, X amount of gold is so much that you can't lift it. Uh, so when you see great piles of the gold, it's total nonsense. Uh, you, couldn't, uh, you couldn't lift it, but it looks so visual. Michael Mellinger recalled how kind Harold Sakata was off camera. 
On camera, however, he was slightly less courteous to Mellinger's character, Kish, during the climactic battle in the vaults of Fort Knox. I often find that uh, whatever people like that are met, boxers and, and, and wrestlers, and, and people who are, are, are tough guys are on screen or in their profession, are really very gentle and, 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 and nice people, and so was Harold Sikasi. You can be a hero. I'm not. <laughs> I, I was thrown over the, over the railings and there were some cargo boxes and mattresses and things that I landed on on the other side. But the actual fall, it was about 40-foot 40, 40 fall, I think, that was done by Bob Simmons. That took quite a long time. I remember lying on the grating for a long time. <laughs> One of the reasons Sean Connery was so identified with the Bond character, often to his frustration, was because of his belief that an actor plays each role with equal intensity. I uh, put in quite a bit of business and uh, a few of the jokes, quite a few of them, but I played uh, always for the reality of every scene as though it was absolutely essential, the truth and a possibility. And uh, any of the fights or whatever one was dealing with. At last, we reached the final confrontation between Bond and Odd Job, a scene which the New York Times described as being drenched in cliffhanging suspense. Well, this is what I enjoy uh, the confrontation. We've set it up, the clock is ticking, the classic clock is ticking. Uh, and there we are. Look, he treats you like a rag doll. Bond, you're in trouble. For Guy Hamilton, creating a film was like creating a series of puzzles, constantly hurling obstacles in the audience's path and never making it easy for them to predict what would happen next. A perfect example of how expertly the Bond filmmakers controlled their audience is the outcome of Bond's fight with Oddjob. For once, Bond is confronted with an enemy who seems to be invulnerable. Everyone knows Bond will prevail, yet viewers are kept on the edge of their seats trying to figure out just how he will prevail. Deprived of his gadgets, Bond has only his ingenuity and courage to protect him. Only the train fight in From Russia With Love rivals this sequence for nail-biting suspense. What is the solution to the problem? Aha, here's the solution. And the audience really fall for this. They're waiting for Odd Job's head to come off, and that's what I want them to think. That they don't expect. Now you're in real trouble. The surprise. And that's where poor Harold burnt himself. But he hangs on in there. As real atomic bombs look as dull as we suspect the interior of Fort Knox looks, Guy Hamilton decided he wanted something different for the lethal weapon Goldfinger wants to use to demolish Fort Knox. The special effects team at Pinewood, headed by Burt Luxford and Frank George, set to work to create a bomb of Bondian proportions. They came up with a device which appeared to be a visual feast of potential destruction. As time runs out, the suspense heightens, and Bond is constantly taunted by that damned clock ticking away toward Armageddon.
Now, Ken, please make it look like an atom bomb. I mean, put lots of, I don't know what it looks like, but put lots of gizmos and tubes and colors and um, amaze me. Along with its destructive power, the atomic bomb prop provided the producers with an opportunity to get the Bond trademark in one last time. What kept you? You okay, James? Where's your butler friend? Oh, he blew a fuse. Three more ticks and Mr. Goldfinger would have hit the jackpot. Did you get him? Not yet, but he won't get far. And Pussy? She hoped to switch the gas in the canisters. By the way, what made her call Washington? I must have appealed to a maternal instinct. Come on, James, get aboard. You can't keep the president waiting. Special plane, lunch at the White House. How come? The president wants to thank you personally. Oh, it was nothing, really. I know that, but he doesn't. I suppose I'll be able to get a drink here. I told the stewardess, liquor for three. Who are the other two? Oh, there are no other two. Goodbye, Felix. So long, James. Good luck. Thank you, Brigadier. Good luck. No one is perfect, not even James Bond. A couple of bloopers occur in this scene that even the most astute fans generally miss. When the plane crew is seen struggling, they are wide awake and alert. When we see them again, they are out cold. Obviously, there was an unintentional reversal of the shots. Also, when Goldfinger parts the curtain, one can see a henchman standing behind him. It's never explained what happens to this man, although after the carnage occurs inside the plane, he's seen lying at Bond's feet after everything else has been sucked out through the window. I even had to warn Pussy about it. By the way, where is she? I will deal with her later. At the moment, she's where she ought to be, at the controls. This, this wasn't easy because, I mean, this is meant to be decompression. There's a lot of, there's a lot of quick cuts and um, a lot of cheating going on. film uh, dreaming about Bond and the men came out walking tall <laughs> which which I mean that's the attraction of the Bond films I think that men identify with him and the females want him and that's that. on behalf of MGM UA home video Eon Productions and Twine Entertainment this is Lee Pfeiffer thanking you for joining us for these reflections on Goldfinger Beckons you to enter his web.